Hey, Soul Tribe, it's Shauna here, and this is our live interview with Benji Shearer. He's a teacher, mentor, coach, and the author of Feelings First Shadow Work. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Hey, everybody, we got author Benji Shearer on. He's the, uh, he wrote the book Feelings First Shadow Work, and he's going to talk to us about it because I think it's very important to have Benji on because a lot of people I have noticed, they don't know how to do the work. They don't know how to start the work, and... Uh, I've been passing out uh, Benji's book like it's candy to everybody that I can possibly, you know, hand it to. So he's going to talk to us a little bit about it. And you want to introduce yourself a little bit, Benji? Okay. Uh, for jumping right into it. Like, you know, we just switched gears all of a sudden. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so my name is Benji. Um, if, if I need to describe myself these days, I'm a teacher, mentor, author. That's that's what I do. Uh, you know, Sean and I were just talking. I hate the word guru. That, that's yeah, what yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and even like light worker is uh, it's uh, I'm, there, there are a million topics here, but like light worker is um, it, it's a term that I associate with. But I think that a lot of people overthink these terms as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a light worker in the sense that I take it upon myself to live my life in a way that's going to help the world, you know, to try and be of service to humanity, which just by the way, to anyone who's on this, who's on the twin flame journey, that whole being of service thing is an integral part of this. It's not just this romantic, nice, happy, whatever, or even a challenging relationship. It's yeah. about leading you towards this kind of mission work, however you want to put, on it, put it. So, yeah, my name is Benji, teacher, mentor, author. I've been doing this stuff for, I guess, about two and a half or three years now. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I started stepping more and more into this work, it became super obvious or super clear that I've been training for this my whole life. Like, right. these are the answers that I was seeking my whole life um, in the sense that I always felt like I was here to do something. And that intrinsic feeling, which many of you may have been feeling as well, really drove me crazy for most of my life because it didn't make any sense. You know, before you go through a spiritual awakening, before when you're just sort of operating in this 3D mentality of Newtonian physics and all, just like the basic 3D realm, it seems crazy to think that like I have a purpose or I have wisdom to share that like, there was this piece of me my whole life that knew that I was here to teach about life. I didn't know about shadow work or about emotional healing, but I knew that I had this in me. And that really created a lot of inner conflict for mm -hmm. most of my life because, you know, the 3D world would teach you or train you to think that you're just arrogant, mm -hmm. to think like, oh, you have something to share with the world. Like, just shut up and go be an accountant already. Like, right. No. So... I spent my whole life desperately seeking answers in a lot of ways, um, including my degrees in philosophy and religion. And so through my searches and academics, philosophy and all that sort of stuff, well, by the time I finished my degrees, I had a very pessimistic sort of outcome. You know, like I was, I was studying philosophy because I was desperately seeking some gap in logic somewhere where I could put God or spirit or religion or whatever. Basically, I had a super intense fear of death. And I was looking for any small gap in logic where I could put like, oh, maybe death isn't what I think it is. And maybe it can open space up. So by the end of my degrees, I didn't find much. Yeah. By the end of my degrees, I had made the decision that the only real meaning to be found in life is in the interactions that we have with others. Right. And that was that I was going to be able to do like that there's no meaning and I I believe that like death is the end and so I've got to live my life in a certain way so I did I lived my life in a certain way and I spent years in music and you know trying to learn to express myself and follow my dreams and follow my passions and when that didn't pan out the way that it should have like I was playing in a band and that didn't go the way it should have um that's when I kind of gave up on myself and my life and my passions and did what any good Jewish boy with a background in philosophy should do, which is go to law school. <laughs> so I up on like being me and like, okay, well, I guess I'll go do what I should do. Yeah. But a few years into that and I did, like my, my higher self was not having it. I, so I hadn't gone through an awakening yet. I didn't know anything about 
about this sort of stuff. But I got to a point where I was so depressed and so anxious, like I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything. And that's when my higher self stepped in. And I went through these like three years, three and a half, maybe four, of, how can I put it? David Suzuki, I think he was asked, what does enlightenment feel like? And his response was, it's basically like regular life, but about three inches off the ground. That's how I felt for about four years. Like I was just doing things. I didn't know how I was doing them. I built my recording studio from the ground up without ever having used a power tool before in my life. And I was, I taught myself how to be a sound engineer and I was performing and I was producing and I was doing all these things. It's just like things were coming. I, I taught myself to paint out of like nowhere. Yeah. And it came out. But anyways. So my higher self took over, got me out of law school, built my recording studio. I was living that life for a while. And then that led me to this whole community of people, uh, which I won't get into the whole story here, but this was a community of people that felt like, like it was the first place in my life that felt like I finally had people that I could connect with and be with, like I was learning how to truly be myself and express myself and everything. But they were very much in their darkness. We were still very much in the heat of So like we were in, it was a community of performers, burlesque performers. I don't know why I'm beating around the bush. It was right. a <laughs> community. Um, and I was there because I was finally learning how to be myself. Whereas most of them were there because they were using that as a way to cover up their wounds, which is something that a lot of artists and performers do. We all do it, but I was at a very different stage of my inner journey than they were. And I didn't recognize any of this. And it created this cycle of emotional abuse that sent me into this really like deep negative spiral where my whole life just started coming apart and I couldn't do anything. And in that community was also this person that I now believe to be like, you know, the, the, the whole twin flame thing. Right. You know, she was involved in that community. Um, and so because of the whole twin flame thing and because of the cycle of emotional abuse that was going on, it completely tore my life apart and pushed me onto this awakening journey, onto the twin flame journey and all that. And sorry, this was like a long way of expressing like, Hey, Benji, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, but that was fine. Yeah. Um, you overall, get- sorry, just one, one really interesting yeah. thing. About, you know how the story ends up is how that led me to to what I'm doing is I never I never chose this mm-hmm. there was no point during this journey that I decided oh I want to be a teacher or I want to be a coach it just as you surrender to whatever it is that's happening and the more that you commit to your inner healing and just being who you are everything just starts falling into place yeah. and you know now that I'm finally like doing this for a living and this is who I am, and I look back and like, how did I get here? <laughs> it's like I'm coming out of a four year long acid trip. Yeah. There's like, I don't know how I ended up here, but hey, this is where I am. This is who I am. So I. I know, but you know, when we, when we started waking up and, and like we kind of met at the same time in that searching frame, right? And I was, yeah. I was telling the, you know, I was talking to Tracy, and it's like when we first, started searching for answers who do we have to go to but a tarot card reader that was allegedly a spiritual guide that we used because we didn't have anybody and you look online and there was all these that's why your book is so important you know what i mean because um we didn't have anybody to ask questions to everything was negative everything was jaded nobody how do you heal you ask somebody how do you heal you run to a tarot card person they're going to tell you something that's going to sell tarot you know what i mean it's like you're totally lost and a lot of people who do tarot are stumbling if they're on the journey at all they're stumbling through it like everybody else and i know that i went crazy on this path um there's nobody the on the same sex you know twin flame path trying to tell me the difference between you know you're supposed to be the divine feminine i'm just like guys must go through that i'm thinking Okay, but why am I following the divine masculine stuff? Like, it had nothing to do with my physical me, but then I had to learn on my own. Oh, we have these two energies inside of us, and we have to heal the distortion and and balance both of them and come into inner union. And then I use both of them, you know, both sides. And um, so it was like just, 
I struggled a lot on the journey, not having any anything. And if you read something, it wasn't really. But like I said, I, I, I got your book and I read it. And we do have a little bit of different uh, coaching techniques. But as a coach, it helped me to see, okay, other people, some people might need to go through these steps. And I was like, oh, my God, where was this when I, when I was started? Why did I have to go fumble through all this? But just like you fumble, you know, started struggling through it. You know, I was doing the same thing. And that's why I'm here. And that's why you're, you're there is that um, we finally get to the level where we can say, hey, let me show you, this is what I did. This is the tools I use, and I can kind of help you uh, with these tools to get to the other side of it, you know? Yeah. So when I was reading this book, I was like, man, you used a lot of great analogies, too. I was like, oh, I'm so proud of him. Like, this is so easy to read. Like, let me tell you something. I bought one of Dr. Phil's books a long time ago, and you're thinking, Dr. Phil, right? No, that thing was Sorry, Dr. Phil. That thing was awful. <laughs> it just got awful. I was like reading. It was such a hard read. I was like, oh my God. He, but they bought their own publishing company and they, him and his son, and they had, uh, you know, he was pushing that book hard. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is such a smooth read. Like from, from page to page, you know, it was like, and I bought my counterpart one too. And um, yeah, I was actually just buying, oh, you can't afford the book. Let me buy it for you. <laughs> <laughs> whoever, was, whoever was connecting with me, I was like, oh, you're having a hard time. I'll get you that book. Don't worry. But, um, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this book. And I could see, like, the process as I was reading it. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I could almost see your writing process. You know what I mean? Like, uh, maybe, maybe, to be honest, like, um, well, I, I know without ego and whatever. Like, I'm a good writer. I know that. Yeah. But what's really interesting about this book, and the two books, because there's a partner book with it, what's really interesting about these is, okay, while I, you know, the stuff that's in there, that's what I'm an expert in, and it is my area of expertise, it's my area of knowledge, that's what I do, but if you asked me to write those books right now, yeah. I don't know that I would be able to. Yeah. Like, they came yeah. through me. You know, I don't like to use the word channeled much because yeah. I'm locked off from some of the spiritual sides of those things but that really is how it happened like i had already started writing like i had written the first 30 pages of the book before i even decided i should write a book like it just started coming out of me so mm. you were saying about me and my writing process my writing process was like my higher self stepped in and then like i wrote both of the books in a yeah. And then spent another two months editing them and polishing them and, you know, building all of the, the infrastructure around them of mm -hmm. how to get them out there and, you know, getting the the designs done and getting the interior yeah. there. And so but, you, really, but the thing about it is it shows, it to me, it, I could just see my whole, like, like, starting and then the whole process of getting to where I am now through, in your book in a way, you know, the way, the healing process, the what I, I struggle through, but it's right here in, in you know, on paper. And I, I remember writing, you know, my background is in religion, right? So I remember writing these books and I told you I had written three books and I didn't publish them all because I look back at it and I've grown so much. I, I'm like, that's not me. That's not me anymore. I don't even believe in that stuff anymore. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to write something that I was like not wanting to back later on. But, you know, it was like, Except for this other book that's still kind of lingering about past lives. Yeah, I'm very much into that, but... Well, it's not, it, it always happens naturally. And, like, there's plenty of stuff that I had started writing or started working on before that, you know, similar to you. Like, I, I wrote it for whatever reason, but by the time it came, like, when it was time to think about, do I want to put this out, do I not? Like, yeah, I didn't resonate with it anymore. Yeah, yeah, t totally, total growth, right? You know what I mean? So. And a lot of us start this journey... Um, writing a book about twin flames yeah. i don't like seven other people who like some clients of mine or whatever but like yeah they we started this journal like oh it's all about twin flames and then by the time they're ready to express themselves mm -hmm. like, oh, it's not really about twin flames anymore it was mm -hmm. about me it was about my journey it was about all this sort of stuff i was yeah. telling a client yesterday i said you know what we don't talk about this much but by the time you get to this part right here you don't really care if your twin flame comes back or not. <laughs> yeah. well, here, here's the, the very first thing 
one of the, let's say, one of the first three things that I learned or understood about Twin Flames, and this is super important for anyone who's going through the Twin Flame journey to understand, because this is the crux of like what me and Sean talk about, like what, what we understand now. By the time you are ready to be with your Twin Flame, Mm -hmm. It won't matter to you if you are or not, because you will be so much in your own power and living as your true self and on mission work and all that, that you won't need any other person to complete you. Right. Now, it's not just important to understand that conceptually, but what Sean and I have realized is that the whole twin flame thing is about the journey to becoming that person. Right. So, same wisdom teaches you that if you want your twin flame right now you need to release expectations you need to surrender to the universe you need to be holding nothing but unconditional love inside of you so that you don't accidentally push your twin away right. you need to master your own energy and master your own traumas and you need to be ready to give unconditional love to someone who's not necessarily yet in that space so th this is the, the huge distinction between the superficial nature of the twin flame journey mm -hmm. and the wisdom that it has to teach you. Now, the more that you focus on the twin flame and what's going on on the outside, the more that you're distracting yourself from the real wisdom that's meant to be had. Mm -hmm. And the more you focus on the real wisdom, the more that you just kind of get disconnected from like, oh, it doesn't matter if it's my twin flame or not. This was what it was all about. Yeah. The time. And, and you know what I noticed too, that I've been focusing a lot on talking about filling your own cup up. Because your counterpart is not going to give you love. They're not going to give you any love. They're not going to show you any love. And that's to teach you that you need to love yourself and have your own self-worth. Because nobody needs to fill your cup but you. And that's why at the end, when you get there, you'll realize you don't really need them because you can already fill your own cup. So, And then, depending on how things are going, you fully don't even want them. Like, I'll be honest with you guys. I, I kind of hope and believe that I've now had my last interaction with her. Really? Um, yeah. it's, there, there's a whole long story there which we won't get into. Yeah. Um, but part of, no, not the end story, but like there was a bit of a time, you know, a lot of us as twin flames, we have this like, if only I could get some confirmation kind of thing, or if only they could admit to me and I would finally know and I would be able to surrender more and be able to do that. So we don't get that yeah. most of the time while we're going through the journey and that's because we need to learn to master ourselves mm -hmm. but what happened to me was once i finally came to the point of relatively full unconditional self-love and was able to like i was finally ready to move on kind of thing that's when she magically got back in touch right. and we reconnecting for a bit but here's the real thing is that when she got back in touch she was still and still is now but like she was still in a lot of her own darkness a lot of pain mm -hmm. um, she actually got in touch with me from no i don't want to reveal any details right right, right. i don't re i don't reveal my counterpart's details i just reveal my side of it in a way yeah, yeah. but so she was in a dark place when, yeah. when she got in touch. and i'm bringing this up because what happened was at the time i i <sighs> In hindsight, I kind of see it as a test, like how unconditionally loving was I? Mm -hmm. Because she, like, she, she had never been there for me. But here she was reaching out at a time when she was in pain, when I was finally ready to move on. Mm -hmm. Was I able to maintain unconditional love for her while maintaining boundaries of what was needed for myself? Mm -hmm. And like that was the right. next stage. And once I was able to prove to myself and you know to the universe that I was, so we had this little time where we got to come back into touch with each other mm -hmm. and away. And I think I think a lot of people think that their counterpart is on the same journey as us they're not they go through a different experience and also they think that they're gonna come back because people say oh they're gonna come they're sovereign they're the sovereign me no they're very much connected to the 3d world they 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 learn they don't seek their own healing it's kind of forced upon them and they just kind of reflect on it and yeah. they have to learn to change their patterns. But it's nothing that they're seeking like we, we are seeking. They're not at that point yet. So, yeah. I mean, my, my counterpart is seeking, but yet city, still staying in some of the same patterns, but she recognizes them. So yeah. sometimes I wonder, like, how, like she was just over yesterday, right? So I'm like, well, how is the universe bringing her back to me? But, you know, like we have all these misconceptions on what it's going to look like. 
But anyway, I love her all the same. I, I love her the same, you know. And I, I actually, there was some kind of shift or switch in me. Maybe it was that unconditional loving thing that came because there, a lot of people love from condition. And when you can love unconditionally, you, I look at her like this. I never want to put her in a cage. I want to always be the cage door opener for her, even if she's putting herself back in there. And I'm not her teacher. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not here to heal her. She's here to do the stuff, but I am here to give her support and love. But she has to do the work herself. You know, yeah. she has to do it, but I can still love her unconditionally and hold that space while she's going through it. And um, I forgot exactly what I was going for because something just popped in my head and I lost my train of thought. But my counterpart is way different. Oh, I was talking about the shift. Okay, the shift about um, she acts much different with me, right? Because she's very attentive with me now. Uh, she responds back to all my texts. And if she, when she was feeling something heavy because I did this with her, I was like, look, I'm, I don't want to overwhelm you with my emotions. Let me... Um, I'm just going to take a couple days to myself, you know what I mean? So I don't overwhelm you. And I felt sad automatically. And I was like, oh, that's her. She doesn't want me to stop texting her. But the, by next, the next day in the evening, we were already back. I've already worked through it. And then she, in return, said, hey, I'm going to go off. Something's it's hitting me. I, I don't know what this is. And um, I'm going to go off grid for, you know, for a little while. And I said, well, thank you. At least you didn't ghost me this time, you know, because she hasn't been ghosting me or anything. And we don't block each other. We don't ghost each other. And then she goes, well, you said it the other day. And then you said that you were going through some stuff. And all, all of a sudden it hit me. And she's like, holy shit, I don't even know what's going on. I, I feel, I go, yeah, you're feeling change. She goes, doesn't feel like, I said, you're healing and you're going through changes. And she goes, doesn't feel like healing to me because <laughs> she doesn't actively seek healing, you know. So... I'm like, yeah, because the divine's going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> That's why. Because <laughs> you're choosing to try to act like you're on a spiritual journey, acting like you're, on, you know, you're still in this old 3D, you know, uh, old belief system and stuff, trying, still trying to live this old 3D paradigm. And I'm like, here, here I, I got you this book. <laughs> Read the, turn to page 29. <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, yeah. I didn't do that to her, but I did send her a book. <laughs> And that's what you know, people need to understand healing does not like it, it can be very like it can feel very freeing once you learn how to surrender to what is going on. Mm -hmm. But basically, we spend our whole lives resisting the very healing that needs to happen. Right. So we spend our whole lives just trying to push away our pain. We're resisting it. We're, mm -hmm. we're avoiding having to feel all of this emotional distress that's mm -hmm. actually trapped inside of us. And what healing feels like is finally feeling that emotional discomfort that yeah. you've been pushed away this whole time. But here's the thing. This discomfort that we experience can't actually hurt you. So the only reason why this healing and release often feels so painful is because we're still resisting it. Right. So... The way that I like to express it, and I think I used, yeah, I'm pretty sure I used this example in the book, but it's, um, you know, as, as if you trained yourself throughout your life that sweating is impolite or yeah, dangerous. You can use that. Your body, yeah, your body needs to perform this natural evolutionary function of sweating. So like when you work out, when your body is heating up, your body needs to do this. It needs to release certain toxins and certain chemicals, and it needs to keep your body operating at a certain temperature. And now, what's a, and because we have prevented ourselves from doing that, we've been resisting our pain, your body has been storing up all of this sweat inside of you. And now what this healing process is, is tapping into that stored pool of trapped sweat inside of you and finally letting it go. Now, when that happens, you're going to feel all of the things that you should have felt the first time. Right. But... The, the big positive, the big difference between doing the healing now and trying to have released those feelings when the trauma happened is that when the trauma happened, you weren't safe, either physically or emotionally or spiritually or whatever. You weren't safe to express yourself. And that's why we put aside the feeling. We needed, like we told our hearts, like, hold on to this. I'm not ready to deal with it now. But now, when you are doing the healing in this, you know, sort of different headspace, you are safe. Mm -hmm. The 
demons inside of you can't hurt you. They can't do anything to you. But the more that we push them away and run from them, the more that they recycle underneath the surface. So what this healing process is, is about letting that stuff from the past finally move through you and allowing it to happen because you know that you're safe now. You know that these uncomfortable feelings can't actually harm you. The way that I put it, like confronting your demons can be painful, but it can't hurt you. Right. And that's the secret. And the more that you learn to surrender to that, the more that a moment of allowing those feelings to move through you can actually feel really good, even though it feels super painful. Like pain is not in and of itself a problem. It's only our resistance to it right. that creates the suffering that we experience. But when you can allow your heart to really feel all of this heartache without needing to solve it, without needing to justify, without needing to explain it, but to actually just fully connect with that pain in your heart right now, mm -hmm. and when you realize that it can't hurt you, that's when this whole thing becomes a really freeing very even pleasant experience where like feeling heartache can be a pleasant experience right <laughs> you know I, somebody wrote um i had union with mine and i was hurt by his words and i ended up ghosting him not on purpose that's that's wounding i mean they don't recognize you know but the, you know the goal is never if you want to be with your counterpart the goal is never union its goal is harmonious union, and it first has to be achieved in yourself before it can yeah. be achieved anywhere else. That's why yeah. people don't stay together. So. Exactly. So now, if you are someone who, like, if you're still in this place where you're trying to figure out how to get union with the winner or how to be in there, we have to shift our perspective. This is where we go to, like, Nikola Tesla. You know, we used to say that if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you need to think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So if you want to be with your twin, then you need to start thinking about this in terms of energy. Mm -hmm. And any this, this is how the whole runner and chaser dynamic comes to be. Mm -hmm. That when, when you are chasing someone, you're putting off a certain energy, a, magne a magnetic kind of energy, where imagine you have two magnets that are both positive. They, they push each other away. So the more that you're chasing someone with this positive, not positive in terms of good or bad, but positive in terms of like magnetism, when you're chasing someone with positive energy, it pushes them further and further away. Right. So if you want to be with your twin flame, the only way to accomplish that is to learn how to sit down in your own energy and just be, or the, the way that I put it is learn how to be the flower, not the bee. Yeah, I say the stayer, not the runner or the chaser, the stayer. But you did use, the, you know, the analogy of the flower, which is great. Yeah, so. that's it. So you need to learn how to be there in your own energy. Just like sit there and allow this person to, to, to come to you. It's sort of like trying to get a timid, abused puppy to come home with you. Right. If you want to chase them and try and pick them up, they're going to run off in the other direction. But if you just... Like, hi there, I hope you're doing all right. I'm going to keep walking in my direction and you walk at your own pace and you let them flow to you. That's how you can get them to, to, you know, to open up and to speak up to you. And here's the secret that we were talking about before mm -hmm. is that as you learn to do that more and more, it becomes less and less important to you whether or not this particular person is going to follow you. And then it becomes up to the universe and both of your higher selves whether or not this relationship is actually right for you. But the point of the twin flame journey is to get you to that point where you realize that it doesn't matter to you anymore. And only then can they possibly show up in your world again, at least, you know, ready to, to be the person that, that you wanted them to. But then it's, it's up to, like I said, the universe and your higher self, because maybe they will be, maybe they won't. Yeah. When I stopped chasing, that's when my twin finally came back into my reality and we got to resolve all of our stuff. Like it was, it was a miracle. The, the things that she had said to me and admitted to me, I have a recording of her. <laughs> Um, 
And like she left me a voicemail once when she felt like she finally apologized and admitted about her ghosting me and admitted about all these things about how she threw me to the wolves and all these sort of things and admitted that I wasn't the villain in her story. Right. I'm like when I heard that, like, oh, yeah. I was, oh my God, I could not believe. And, but then she lost that mm-hmm. again. Like she had this brief period of self-awareness. Yeah. And then slipped back into slumber. <laughs> slumber. Yeah, she had an epiphany, and she was being guided, and then something happened that, you know, yeah. yeah. It, my mind for like for this for one week when she got back in touch, mm-hmm. she was she was speaking as if she was like reading out of a therapist's handbook. Mm. She was like, it, like using all just like the most enlightened up there phrases and then now she's she's back into her cycles in the dark and that's why we're that's why we're not speaking again now yeah. it, not because of any hate not because of any anger between the two of us but just because like she's not looking to get to where i'm at emotionally speaking and i'm no longer looking to force her to be anything yeah. other than oh so that's cool. another thing i was i was gonna say when i hit that shift and it was just like, you know, I, you know, I was talking about the caging and I'm leaving the door before. I just want her to be able to find her own way and, um, you know, my counterpart to be able to find her own way and make her own decisions. And it's just like, I'm just like, whatever you're going to do, like, oh, you're still talking about drugs or drinking. I'm like, it no longer triggers me. And I'm just like, well, you, the divine, as the divine changed me, the divine will change you too. So I have pure faith <laughs> that yeah. she will be cutting a lot of that behavior, you know, out, you know, but they, they like to merge themselves in toxicity and they don't realize it's toxic, you know, that's it. She was my, my twins very much still defending her toxic traits to me uh, or, you know, again, I don't like giving too much, but look, as far as everyone who's watching this is concerned, it's just anonymous. No one knows who she is anyway. Right. So, um, she is so like known. She's not. She knows she's an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, we all know that. Like she's admitted, and she has now recently taken a job that requires her to drink, and she's defending that wow. decision. Like you know, oh well, this is where my universe has taken me, or this is my decision. This, and so I got to a point where, like, on the one hand, I know that it's not the best decision, mm-hmm. but. It's not up to me. Yeah. So, okay. It's their life. It's their journey. They're on their own journey and they got to learn the hard way. And I was just saying that to my counterpart yesterday. Sometimes people just, the only way they learn is the hard way. You know, you keep. It's, look, sometimes it is just about divine timing. You know, like I didn't get to decide when I woke up and right. you didn't get to decide when you woke up. And so that's, that's why I'm conflicted a little bit. And on the one hand, like. I can, you know, when you see someone destroying themselves, and on the other hand, there's our interpretation of divine timing and divine providence kind of thing. Like, do I just accept that this is her journey, or or should she just accept that this is her journey? Like, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, I very much am confused these days. About- I believe that we truly write our journey before we come here. The destiny yeah. is at the end, it's the same, but the, the choices we make, you know, we have the choice. Do we go this way to the journey or this way to the journey? One is easy and one is hard. And everything is for a reason. I totally believe that everything happens for a reason. There's no such a coincidence. There's no accident. You know, um, we got here, we were on autopilot and we still made it here. We, now we're conscious yeah. and even conscious now, people get in their own way. At what point does that become an excuse. So like for you and me, for example, like I didn't know this stuff Mm -hmm. before I went to my awakening. Whereas the irony with her is that she's actually aware of the universe. She was actually more spiritual and more aware than me. Being Um, aware and, and, and actually living the life is completely different though. We actually live the life. (laughs) Where is the line right now? When she says something to me, we're like, she's an alcoholic who just chose a job and like, this is a long-term career thing. Mm-hmm. Like she, this is a job that has benefits and will pay out of this. So she's committing to this in the long term. And then she's telling me like, well, my universe took me here. So don't try and tell me about like, cause I, I tried to have this sort of like mini, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's just going to end up as a karmic lesson for her. 
in, in intervention. Mm -hmm. Like I tried to right. express to her. I was very calm, very loving, but I just wanted to make sure that she had thought about this decision that she's making. Right. You know, have, have you considered, you know, what it is that you're really committing to by, by taking a job like mm -hmm. And so she then tried to respond, like, look, this is where my universe is in me. Mm -hmm. And this what I'm asking right now, where is that line between like if you know about your journey, but you're justifying in reinforcing your alcoholism because, oh, well, this is just where my universe is taking me. We're, but that's her that's her journey that's her story that's where she has to go she has to hit rock bottom you know that before she can rise up and the journey will take her to hit rock bottom and we don't want to see that we hate to see that for our counterparts but there's nothing you can lead a horse to water you can't make them drink you can give people all the tools to healing but you can't make yeah. them use them you know and so that's why, as I said earlier, I, I kind of believe and, and maybe even hope that we've had our last interaction at least for a while because yeah. because it's not up to me. I can't make her drink the, the healing. I can't make her see this stuff. Right. And if she's committing to that is like this is her journey, then, then that's fine. Yeah. And here's another thing for, you know, for Twin Flames to, to consider while you're going through this um, is that even if, let's just say you, you – believe that you are absolutely destined to be with your twin flame but that is the like there's no way around it that's what this is like if you have your twin flame you guys are meant to be together let's just say that that's true mm -hmm. it could still very much be the case that her and i are supposed to come together like 40 years from now like we're still pretty young yeah maybe we're supposed to leave this earth together but if you cling on to this idea that you and your twin are meant to be together right now and then like even for a part during my journey for example mm -hmm. i believe that i would not be able to fulfill my mission without my twin by my side which was just a limiting belief but like if you hold on to that i mean like tracy and glenn you might be using your story she's talking about i could never do what they're doing you know what i'm saying i could never be with my counterpart trying to heal with them and i even told my own counterpart that we need this separation because i that's not i i know i wrote my story the way i did for a reason because i could not be with her i would be jealous and controlling and i would never heal with my counterpart until this point now i'm just like whatever you're gonna do you're gonna do it and i'm just gonna keep living my life because my life is great i live a i live a beautiful life you know I want nothing. I have a need for nothing. So things just come to me. Yeah. You know, I'm living the best life I can possibly live in. I keep changing every single day. So you can have, you can have the life you're living in, in toxicity and, and um, repeating patterns. Or you can, hey, look at this life I'm living. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like, come live happy life over here, stress-free. <laughs> yeah. But, that's it. That's what this is all just pushing us towards is yeah, to discover our best lives. And I think like even both you and I, if, if we want to use the word best, yeah. I think both you and I, we, we've got even better to look forward to. Our lives are just going to Oh, yeah, better. I know. I mean, I, mean I, I retired. I don't even have to work. I do this because it's my passion. That was the 2020, May of 2020. The government finally said, guess what? You win. Here's the blah, you know, the, something I've been fighting with the government on. And they're like, here, you get a paycheck every month. And it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm thinking, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, universe. I needed that. So now whatever I do, you know, I, I just do it because I love to do it. I, I, you know, I mean, TikTok is becoming kind of a job, but it's like I'm passionate about it. When you're passionate about something, you're successful at it. So, yeah. You know, I can do healings and talk to people, but I, I tell them, look, I can heal you. It'll heal your physical pain for a few minutes. But unless you get that wound, unless you get down to that wound, it's going to come back because the divine is trying to tell you something. And this is another thing I tell my counterpart. She sees everything through the physical. And I'm just like, you know, I no longer look through the physical. I see everything as a spiritual intervention you know everything happens to us for a spiritual reason or cause or whatever and once i understood that then everything was like well how can i learn from this you know what are you trying to tell me now and it really started a conversation with my spiritual team and my you know my angels and whoever i connect with so everything to me has a meaning behind it everything is a lesson to me that i can look deeper 
inside of myself and say, okay, how can I learn from this? What am I getting from this? That's a little much. I know. I over... Um, I, I fully get what you're saying. I fully, I fully resonate with it as well. But I also do kind of want to give something of a warning to, to you know, any uh, to people who might be listening that it is a danger for some of us to over spiritualize things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not denying what you're saying that like everything does in fact have a sort of meaning and an understanding and lesson behind it. But a lot of people kind of cling to the spiritual element of that a little too much, which distracts them from the inner healing that needs to be done. Like it's very easy to just write things off and as, oh, well, well, you know, the universe wanted that or it's just a lesson. Oh, no, no, I don't say that. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't not, say that. I'm not, I'm not saying, yeah. I'm just saying yeah. sometimes when we say these phrases of like everything happens for a reason or everything has a meaning, some people misconstrue that yeah. and end up lost in these cycles because like, we, we need to find that balance, mm -hmm. I think, between the 3D understanding of things and a 5D understanding. And I really think that that is, in fact, what this whole ascension is about. You know, that people talk about what's magical about this ascension process that we're going through mm -hmm. is that, like, for the first time in history, we got to achieve this ascension while maintaining our physical bodies. Mm -hmm. And that is what this journey is about. We are learning how to be spiritual beings mm -hmm. while living in the 3D world. Yes. We yeah. don't get to separate the two. Yeah. You don't get to just disconnect from it. Like being a spiritual being mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you don't have to look both ways when you cross the street. Right, 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 right. right. As spiritual as you want, but if you get hit by a truck, you're still going to die. Yeah. So I'm... You're going to wake back up in your spiritual self and that that's great. But we need to learn how to maneuver the 3D world while maintaining this 5D right. spirituality, especially for people like you and me as light workers, mm -hmm. because we need to, you know, I, I don't know if, like, if you have much experience with psychedelics, but like it takes practice to bring wisdom from the spiritual world, from a psychedelic experience into the 3D world. You know, it takes practice to bring those two frequencies of your brain together and as light workers and teachers that is our job well to the thing about this is funny because my counterpart had mentioned psychedelics and i said to her when i connect with the divine that's how my life is like i see things like if it's if i'm having a trip like a psychedelic thing that people would never believe because i have that ability to connect that way but when I'm speaking light language, I actually get a spiritual high from it. But all that came because I was healing. <laughs> it all came from my healing. And um, I guess you, you master this. But another thing I was going to say is that I have the ability to look from the higher mind down on my situation. But a lot of times I was not, you know, earlier I would look, but it was still hurting me. And I was trying to, I was trying to take my logical mind and say, okay, I can see why this is happening. And they're like, my team, I was like, mm, you're human. You know, you're in a human body. You still need to release those emotions. You still need to grieve those things. You can look from the higher mind. Great. That's a great perspective. But your human self still needs to grieve and, and release those emotions. So yeah. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's how I learn stuff. <laughs> this higher perspective about our lives is, is at least for now, it's, it's meant to help keep us moving. And like there aren't, a, like, it's, it's sort of, it's part of where we start. We need to understand the higher perspective about our lives yeah. so that we don't be getting lost in this 3D game and in these subconscious cycles. But then you have to remember, like, exactly as you were saying, yes, I'm a human and I, I'm a mm. human being right now and I need to release these things in a natural way. Um, and this is what I was saying a moment ago about people who get lost in the over-spiritualization of right. something. Mm -hmm. that when they don't understand, like you just expressed, that, oh, I am also still a human being right now. Right. The people try to just be this spiritual being without actually doing the inner work necessary. Um, or even if they do, but like if they're just clinging too much to this spiritual notion. Like I said, the type of people that, again, this is just a metaphor, but who won't look both ways before crossing the street because I'm just a spiritual being right, right. now. Like, yeah. You are, mm -hmm. but you're in a human body right now, and you don't get to pretend otherwise. You don't get to pretend otherwise. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. And 
I, I meet so many different people and they use all this different terminology, but we all basically say the same thing. And, but there are a lot of people that get so confused and caught up with the spirituality. But once again, I always go, always go back to the healing. I cannot, I cannot, I could have never got to where I am now if I didn't do the inner work. I would have never found myself. I would have never understood myself. I would have never, and I always say that the twin flame journey is and always will be about self-discovery and healing, you know, yeah. and um, it's like once you do that, hit that inner union, it's like so much freedom comes with it. And yeah. I don't, I don't, I can't even explain it myself, that shift that happened with me. And I just saw my counterpart as a different part, like her own little being. And I've always seen her on her own journey. I've never, in the very beginning, I thought we were on the same journey doing the same things, but I learned very quickly that we were not going through the same things, you know? That's an interesting point also. That, like, there were a lot of intuitive messages that I got while I was on my twin flame journey mm -hmm. that weren't necessary to push me in a given direction, but which I later discovered were not true at the 3D level. Like, you know, thinking about our twins as being on the same journey or thinking about getting some intuition about what your twin is going through at this very moment mm -hmm. that required in order to get me to do certain things or blah, 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 but which I later discovered like, oh, no, at the 3D level, it wasn't true that she was going through this. It wasn't true that she had those same sort of thoughts. And, I, in fact, made a huge fool of myself by trying to, which, just as, as a random note for Twin Flames, I personally, maybe you have a different um, opinion here, but one question a lot of the times is, do you tell your twin about the whole Twin Flame thing when you go through it? I very much believe no. I wish I did not know anything about it. I don't know how that would help me. I mean, I guess knowing about it helped me do some research, but... I kind of wish I wasn't, because it kind of screwed me up. I mean, we probably would have been together if I didn't say, oh my God, we're in separation now, or this is happening, or, or this is going to happen, or this, and, and it was like, I should, we could have just went through naturally, but then, like I said, I would have been jealous, and I would have been controlling, and, because I had to shed all those things, you know, it's like, I had to get through that trauma that, why I was like that, you know, and, so I don't know. So I don't know. Like my, actually my counterpart told me about twin flames because she thought she had one before me. And then I was like, Hmm. But then I started reading about age gaps and all this stuff. I was like, Oh, you, I think you better rethink that because me and her have a 22 year age gap. And I've never had anybody in my head that I couldn't get rid of before, you know, dancing around in there making like, I can't even go back to school. Like I couldn't concentrate on anything, nothing. Yeah, so that's but I, but I do, we do have a gift of this divine mirror and people don't sit with themselves long enough to understand that they can figure out, they don't need to run the tarot or anybody else because they can feel what their counterpart is going through. But a lot of people get lost in that energy and claim it as their own. And they don't realize that all of a sudden when you're just happy and fine and you start crying, uh, it's the other person you're connected to, <laughs> you know, or... Like me, I was feeling like this really, just lately, recently, I was like feeling this. I'm like, I don't like this feeling I'm feeling. It feels weird. Like, almost like I have a baby or some kind of transformation. Is I felt like it, some kind of transformation was happening. I'm like, mm, I don't know. And I said something to her and then come to late, find out it was her. You know, she was like, she's like, I can't take this. I don't know what I'm doing. What's happening to me? Huh? Yeah, you're going through a metamorphosis. Look, well, here's something that, that I you know, sort of learn to, to, to do or deal with you know, what, what I'm going through this time. So whether we're looking at ourselves as empaths and we're feeling other people's pain or as the whole twin flame thing and we're feeling other people's, mm -hmm. while I'm not going to deny that we might be feeling something that's coming from someone else because mm -hmm. I do resonate with an empath and I did have that whole twin flame connection, mm -hmm. what you have to understand is that by the time you are feeling it inside of you, you are feeling it. Yeah. You're point in justifying this as oh it belongs to someone else and it's coming from someone else once you're feeling it inside of you it's inside of you you have the opportunity to heal it inside of you right and part of the over spiritualization mm -hmm. that people sometimes go to that like if if i'm feeling my twin pain mm -hmm. i explain to myself like oh this just belongs to my twin 
then that leaves me with nothing really to do about it. Mm. It's this person's pain. But when I recognize that, even if I'm feeling my twin's pain, that pain is inside of me right now. Right. Means I don't have access to it. I get to heal this stuff inside of me. Mm. This is what I express to, to, to you know, empaths who feel this also, that what's really going on, when you are feeling someone else's pain, a lot of the time, not all the time, you may have a different opinion, that's okay, um, is this other person's pain is triggering that same frequency that exists inside of you. Yeah. So if I'm feeling, let's say, someone else's jealousy, mm -hmm. the only way that that jealousy can cause me pain is if there is jealousy that lives inside of me. Right. Whereas if I have no jealousy inside of me, then their jealousy can't hit me in the same way. It's very much like when a singer breaks a wine glass. Mm -hmm. What's happening is that the vibrations from the, person, from the person singing resonate with the vibrations of the wine glass. Whereas if the singer is singing a different frequency, mm -hmm. then that wine glass isn't going to shake, it's not going to vibrate, it's not going to break. So the only way in which someone else's pain can truly be hurting you internally is if you carry that same frequency inside of you. So instead of looking at this as this is someone else's pain that I just have to deal with, it's much it's much more helpful at least to recognize that, oh, this is triggering something that exists inside me. So here's an opportunity for me to heal and for me to get even stronger and even better. And that is then how we even become better, stronger. Healers. Well, it will, it will project. Um, it will project. Her, her thing will project because of the mirror. It will reflect back to me, um, kind of like what you're saying. And um, it will reflect on something that she's going through will reflect back the same thing, but my version of it, my version of it, you know? Well, what I'm saying yeah. is that by the time that you, and not just you, but my, myself also, by the right. time that we are, let's say, completely healed, as if that were a thing. Yeah, I don't think that's everything, yeah. I, for the sake of for the sake of this discussion, let's just say we got to a place where we were completely healed. We would be able to feel someone else's pain without it hurting us. Right. The same way. We'd be able to sense that someone else is in pain. I don't know because I feel people's physical pain. <laughs> I feel yeah. I feel their physical pain. But at least, at least, like you can learn how to feel without the same fear and resistance that they're yeah. feeling. So you can feel the sensations, but you won't suffer the same oh, right, way. Right, right. That That's what I'm saying. It's not that we don't feel it. It's that the suffering that we experience is only like it's only suffering if we're still carrying fear. And but you know what? I never had the same experience that people did on the twin because I was like. I'm not really suffering a lot. I'm not really like the way that people were using all these colorful words and they're in such pain from the beginning, I guess, because people were saying, well, these triggers are meant for your own healing. And I wanted to get back to my counterpart. Right. So I was like jumping in wholeheartedly about what this work was. And I was like, okay, she, if I'm triggered, okay, now I know I'm supposed to heal something. And I went like, I never did it like she was ever hurting me or, uh, you know, I mean, I know what you're saying about if we feel something on our side, don't just brush it off and say it's, it's them. But I never went through a lot of people, like a lot of people, you know, use all these flamboyant, colorful words of like they're writing a novel, a romance novel, and there was such pain and whatever. And I, I never looked at it that way. Maybe that's why I've where I'm at now faster than a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I guess well, overall what I'm saying, which is also like, I think we, we both had kind of divergent paths but ended up in the same place. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You said that I, I got here, I think a little bit faster than some, which, but I got here because, and like this is where we diverge, we had sort of two different impressions and yeah. different opinions. That with me, it's it's about whatever you're feeling in the moment. That, that's what I'm saying, that it's not, a, it, like the story about where this is coming from mm -hmm irrelevant right it doesn't matter to me if the pain that i'm feeling right now is my pain or if it's someone else's pain or if it's collective energies or if it's stuff from the past it doesn't matter right whatever I'm feeling right now that's what i'm feeling that's what i need to learn how to deal with and by the way that is what my whole feelings first shadow work approach is all about yeah it's about 
bypassing the stories, bypassing the logic, bypassing the over spirituality, and learning how to connect directly to what you're feeling right here, right now, because none of the rest of it matters. Every moment of emotional distress we experience right. is pointing us in the direction of where we need healing. So when this uncomfortable emotion comes up, Anything that we're doing to distract ourselves from what we're feeling, which is the story or who it's coming from or collective energies or all of that. Maybe it's about an eclipse that's happening or a full moon. <laughs> it is. But I personally mm -hmm. find no value mm -hmm. in using those explanations. You're very so, scientific. <laughs> You're very scientific. Not exactly. That's, that's not what I'm saying. It's, yeah. it's not... I'm not trying to justify it based on science. I'm just trying to not justify it at all. Uh -huh. If I'm feeling down on a certain day, is it because of collective energies? Maybe. Yeah. Is telling myself that it's because of the collective energies helpful to surviving or to healing or to doing anything better? No, really all it is is helping me explain and justify my pain. Mm. That's not helpful. So it might be the case that it's the collective energies or the super moon or whatever. But telling myself that is not going to help hmm. so what i focus on is not the stories it's the feeling i learn how to just feel whatever i'm feeling in the moment and the more that we can learn to do that the more that the unresolved emotions can move through us and then we can naturally learn to connect to the spiritual side more in a way that you do mm -hmm. and and i'll be completely honest like i do feel disconnected like, i can't connect to the spiritual side in the way that you do right and i but i could i want to i hope that i get there eventually yeah in the meantime and this is i think you know an important distinction that i think we there are reasons why i can't connect and there are reasons why you can and i think that one of those reasons is because we are meant to help different people right right there are, there are people that need my perspective which right. is all about emotions and there are people that need your perspective a little bit more which is about the channeling spirit and then the guide and if i was able to connect the higher dimensional spirituality in the way that you could then i wouldn't be at this frequency and this space in order to help the people that need me yeah but it's very hard to maintain this um people don't really understand how hard it is for me because my whole life has changed it's not easy to just i have to be a very high vibrational my body has to be maintained a very uh, high vibrationally to channel i have to eat healthy foods all the time i have to be at a certain vibration all the time and that's conscious thinking feeling you have to be aware of everything i'm doing and and you know what I'm saying? I isolate all the time. It's it's not it's not easy. And and people that are channeling, I mean, like there's a huge difference between like people what I what I do and some people that do the same exact thing. A lot of people they hear light language, oh, yeah, or they people are doing reiki re and all they're doing is this and they're not making a sound. And people don't feel it. And then they jump on my jump on my feed and all of a sudden they're talking about, oh my god, why am I feeling all this stuff? Why am I feeling it? Could tell me why my throat, why, why, why. I'm like, it says powerful, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, because, you know, one, uh, you know, celibacy, that's a powerful tool. And, um, you know, being, hey, the journey is body, mind, and soul. It's just not focused on one, one area. But most all of it is healing. <laughs> we cannot yes. ascend. We can't do anything without inner healing. So... Yeah. And that's why I'm saying God bless you for writing that book because, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't write that book. I, I, you know, I don't have the patience for it, even though, you know, and it's just exactly what people need right now because I connect with so many people and what, what are they telling me? I, they don't, I realize this. They have no idea where to start. They have no idea how to do any type of shadow work, or any type of inner healing work. They don't know what a trigger is. They think people are hurting them. They don't realize that it's an emotional wound that's, you know, popping its ugly little have emotional response. And um, I wish that I could just drop these from an air, from, from a plane. <laughs> I really do. And I'm glad you wrote another one, like a follow-up book. Because I would put little, I would put little, um, you know, parachutes on them, paraphernalia on them, drop them down everywhere. <laughs> people everywhere, please. Please, yeah. buy Benji's oh, book.
that one. I trust and believe that it will find all of the people that it needs to find on its own. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's the beauty of a book like this is that it lasts, you know, people will be reading this stuff hopefully for the next 20 years. Yeah. And, is, uh, is this because you, you're also a coach. So I know you got eight... a mentor, but yeah. Oh, okay. A mentor. So is this the same thing that you're teaching the same exact thing or there's more things that you go over well, in your oh there's definitely more what i would say is that the this book is the overarching wisdom that i teach but it's not all the nitty-gritty so mm -hmm. this is like then the book is like it's like reading a book on swimming versus taking swimming lessons right right right, right. So, you know, in my mentoring and in my course, we dive into all of the nitty gritty and how to actually, you know, do all this sort of stuff. Whereas the book is the overarching wisdom and the overall guideline, the outline of what this journey is supposed to be. The book is everything that you need to understand about the healing journey so that you don't get lost going in circles. Because so many people, and this is what the whole feelings first thing is about, which you know, is that so many people spend all of this time hunting down their trauma, you know, trying to do this logically and analyze all this, whereas that's not what this is about. Answers will come the more like, you need to connect your heart space and raise your emotional levels and become aware of this stuff to even make sense of the answers that you might find analytically mm -hmm. if you're searching for your trauma and all that sort of stuff. Like chasing down your trauma analytically is it's kind of like a dog chasing a car. Even if you caught it, you don't know what to do with it. Right, right, right. It's about learning how to let this stuff out naturally. And as you learn how to embody unconditional self-love a little bit more, then all of these things will start making sense to you. All of the revelations that you need will start happening naturally. But this is about building emotional muscle and skills and tools so that you can be ready to receive all of this knowledge and all these revelations and to, you know, to step into that higher version of yourself. Right. So, let me, yeah, show, you, let me show you his book, guys. Let me see if it'll show on here. Not too far. Here's his yeah. book. Right? Healing First Shadow Work. Yep. Now, I know I put this uh, on my feed. And I know that I um, uh, put a little, uh, I, don't, I think I, I'm not sure if I connected you with it, but he, he is on TikTok. He just started out on TikTok. So if you guys want to follow Benji, what is yeah, your, what is your thing my, under? I think my channel is, it's Emotional Mastery 222. Okay. I think that's what it's called right now. Um, and for any of you who are interested in the book, you should know that you can get it on Amazon if you want. You can get the, the, uh, the audit, like, audio version or the physical version of the pdf um or like for your kindle um but if you want on the website you can get it a little cheaper as well and with it you'll get um 10 guided meditations and five manifest audio tracks uh the website it's benji i'll put a i'll put a link to it so yeah. slash ff book ff is feelings first so yeah, she'll, she'll put a link. But yeah, I'll, just, I'll make sure you guys have a link to him. And, yeah, so um, there you can get either the PDF or the audio book, and it comes with those bonuses. So if they want to reach your coaching sessions, they go through your website too, and to schedule or? Yeah, well, I don't, um, I'm not actually doing coaching for right. now. Like, I don't do one-off sessions. I have my course that mm -hmm. I teach people how to do this. And the reason is because, like, look, if we were to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, mm -hmm. we can do one-on-one -on -one sessions for the next 10 years. Right. Because you go up every day and, like, you're just going to talk to me about what's going on in your life and we're going to go around, like, I'm going to give you, like, just very specific answers right now. But the course has everything that you need. It's all of the life skills and tools that you need to master your emotions. So my goal overall with the course is that by the end of it, you shouldn't be reliant on me or anyone else. I say, I say the same thing. I'm like, look, I'm a healer, but I don't want repeat customers. I don't want right. people coming back to me. I want to give you the tools. I want you to be able to do it yourself. You come to me, and, you yeah. know. So that's it. The people who take my course, they get extended support from me. Like you get access to my Facebook group. And I'm always like, I'm 100% invested in all of my students. So I'm never going to abandon you. Like you, you will always have access to me right. for me to ask questions and to help you out. But the idea is that, this course is 
is designed to give you the knowledge and the tools and the skills, not to make you reliant on me of like, I would like to show up to a therapist every week right. and just tell me all of your problems. Mm -hmm. Because then we, it's like it's just going around in circles. You're going to show up, you're going to tell me your problems, and I'm going to soothe you and make you feel better, and maybe I'll give you advice about this specific scenario. But the idea is that I want you to know how to handle any scenario ever for the rest of your life. And then I want you to step into your power and in your mission work, and you're going to go and teach what I taught to other people, but you're not going to teach what I taught. Mm -hmm. Teach the wisdom translated through your experience. Right, right. You're not going to copy. Like, here's another thing. I never want any of my students to say the phrase, well, Benji said this. Mm -hmm. Not about what I said. What I said should resonate with you because it's the truth. Right. So it's like when you are explaining to someone else what I said, you shouldn't be saying, oh, well, my coach or my teacher or my mentor said this. Mm -hmm. You should be saying, oh, well, this is this. Like when I explain something to you, like it's always fear or love. Those are the only two things that really drive our decision. It's just a random example. Right. I want one of my students to say, well, my coach says that it's either fear or love. I want my students to say it's either fear or love. Right. None of it. I was, I was giving you truth. I was giving you wisdom. Right. Not, you should know. It shouldn't matter. Like, and you should never regurgitate something that I said yeah. in a list it fully makes sense to you. And by the time it fully makes sense to you, it doesn't matter where it came yeah, from. Yeah, that drives me nuts when people just regurgitate information. It, I, <laughs> I know. I'm mean, like, Rah. because somebody told me, somebody said, came on my feet and said, oh, this twin flame journey is a journey of the soul. It's not the mind. I'm like, what? It very much is the journey of the mind. I mean, how do you, where do you go? You got, where are your wounds at in your subconscious mind? Where, where are you going to go to meditate in your mind? Where, you know, it's like things people say just don't make sense to me because yeah. We got to go to the mind. We can't. We got to elevate. We got to be conscious thinkers and observers. How is our soul ever going to progress? Like I don't. Yeah. I don't understand where she was coming from, but I'm sure she just heard it and just repeated it. You know, and yeah. I don't. That'll drive me crazy. So yeah. I'm like, if I ever regurgitate something, please stab me in my eye or something. <laughs> just stab me in my yeah. forehead because I'll be like. Mm. No, because in the beginning, we got on that Twin Flame programming. You know, me and Tracy were talking about that. It's like people think that this has to go a certain way, a certain direction, or look a certain way. And we get rid of religion, and we get rid of you know, the program of religion, and like all these old belief system politics, and blah, blah, blah. But we just replace it with this Twin Flame, how it's supposed to look and how it's supposed to be. And no, it can go however it's meant for your healing, for wherever direction is going to take you, you know? Yeah, look, more than we hold on to any title, whether it's Starseed or Lightworker or Twin Flame or whatever it is, the more that we're missing the point. Yeah. These labels are meant to push us in a direction until we get comfortable enough to drop the labels. They don't right. mean as much as they think they do. And then, you know, here's another thing that we all have to understand about these spiritual labels is there's no... Like, sometimes people ask this question, how do I know that I'm a light worker? Or how do I know that I'm a star seed or whatever? And they ask this question as if, it's like, oh, well, there's a blood test you can take. Yeah. Like, if you have an antibody, you are a light worker. Like, no, it's, it's a vague term that we use to help us understand ourselves. Yeah. And once we fully understand ourselves, we don't need to cling on to that title as much anymore. Right. So I describe myself as a light worker only in the sense that this is how I live my life. Right. Well, I, I, was, I dropped the whole Twin Flame label for a long time, but in order for me to um, achieve what I want to achieve, I have to use the title to attract the people that need to hear the information. You know what I mean? But yeah, there's nothing wrong with using yeah. these words to express something to others, but we need to be less and less invested in that as our identity. Right, 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 right. Belong. But that's it. Like, I no longer cling on to any of these terms. Sometimes I need to use these terms because we are teachers. We right. need to express them to people. Yeah. But at the beginning, we are very much invested. Like, I am a twin flame. We take so much pride in this identity of it. Yeah. And the further that I get in my journey, the less I have any 
ideas about identity whatsoever. Like, yeah. I don't know who Benji is anymore, and it doesn't matter, because I'm really just a vessel, you know? Yeah, I just, yeah. And the more that I let go of my past and let go of my future, the more that I just am. So who is Benji? I, I don't know. Benji is who I'm even talking to right now. That's it. Right, right, right. I describe Benji. You can if you want, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know anymore. And it's like, I do feel more and more like letting go of ego in the sense that I don't even, I can't even envision like, something that I could accomplish in my life that would define me. It doesn't like, now it's, I just, I realize more and more and more how at the end of the day, we're all just moving through this world. And by the time that we're old, like, you can't even look back on your life and compress it into anything mm -hmm. that's what, we're just, we're just floating through this world. Yeah, just going with the universal flow. That's all you can do. And yeah. then you're going to, Go back, start over again. <laughs> if you're lucky, if you're not lucky, if you're lucky, I don't know. So, uh, I don't know. You know, people have all these ideas, but... I definitely hope I'm coming back. I don't, I don't think that this is my last lifetime, if anything. And I very, I very much look forward to being young again in a more awakened world. Yeah, know? right? Because we do continue where we left off. So, if we're awakening now, I can't imagine what the next our next life would be or... How would we come back and navigate that? It would be very interesting. Or yeah. maybe we'd go somewhere else and navigate that yeah. that vessel or whatever. I, I don't know. I can only think about right now, too. I just think about now. I try not to think too much about the future. Although I do have things that I do think about. I guess think about, you bring about, manifest it or whatever. But I don't put any attachment to it. So, yeah. so. Uh, even in terms of manifesting and stuff like that, like I, and I, we sort of alluded to this earlier in our chat, like I very much don't know anymore how much free will we actually have. You know, like yeah. I, I recognize how I've always been pushed in one direction or another, at least from my emotions. And there'll be, I, in hindsight now, in my life, I'm looking at where I ended up. I really believe that I chose any of them. I mean, I chose it from, from my higher perspective. I chose it before I came right. into this thing. But everything else, like, it happened when it's happened, when it happened, and there's nothing that I could have done yeah. to either make it earlier or make it happen later or not make it happen at all. But, like, there were even things that, like, if you had asked when I was 10 years old how I thought my life was going to go, I actually would have given you a super accurate answer, including all the things that I didn't want to happen. But at 10 years old, I knew that I was going to end up in school, even though I didn't want to be there. Huh. <laughs> and there I go, it all played out. And like, I knew how I knew. I didn't actually know that I was right. I knew how my life was going to go up until my awakening. Like, I knew how my life was going to go until about the age of 27 or 29. You know what's and funny, that, Benji? When you say uh, you knew what you were going to be, when I was like 10, I was having a full mass in my room and my mom and my brother were my patron, <laughs> like my my uh, little, you know, and then I ended up being an outreach pastor. So like we do repeat things that, like that's a glimpse of our past lives repeating, you know, so, but. For me, just some part of me knew why I was here. Like, I don't yeah. know. I just, I had this. I, I could see everything up until my awakening, like yeah. some part of what was happening. And then when that started happening, now it's, now it's all up for grabs. Right. I what coming next. Right, right. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. That's true. Yeah. That's true. That part of turning 30 was actually really scary for me because all of a sudden I was past this age where I understood anything about myself and about life. Yeah. Uh, That's, that is true. You know, I never thought about what you just said. It's like up until the awakening. That's because we're like on autopilot, I think just revisiting things like, you know, tacking on to what we've already done with the lessons we had to learn. And now it's, this is completely new. We're writing something completely new as a conscious being here. You know, Do you know, we've talked for over an hour and we talked for an hour and 18 minutes. Like I couldn't see the clock until I pushed the button. And I was like, holy crap, we've been talking a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem awesome. like it. It's just going. Yeah, it just keeps going. So that's pretty cool. But. I really enjoyed talking to you. I enjoy seeing you. you. Look great, man. So, you know. Same here. Same to you. You've definitely changed a lot over the last few years. That's why. <laughs> right. Probably. Uh, when, 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 you know, I guess not. But uh, yeah, no. I when I 
uh, just before I, I actually started going through my real awakening, I went through this whole really weird stage. I shaved my head and was going through this whole really weird stuff. So yeah. We've both changed a lot in the last few years. My, like, my, my looks keep changing. My physical appearance keeps changing. I, I don't know. Like, I just... My my counterpart doesn't even like it doesn't even phase her anymore because I started one way like when we first met I dropped like eighty pounds and then like my hair is brown and blonde and whatever I just changed my hair I don't care it's shorter now than it's ever been because she had to cut all my color off but I get I'm going blonde again uh, in July. <laughs> and, I'm, I'm definitely still changing a lot, still putting more effort into into a lot of things. But I'm I'm actually I don't know what's popped up, but I'm actually really excited for the next year or two so well, even before i went through my awakening um i got certain signs from the universe that 2022 yeah. is my and then i had other people like through numerology astrology and palm readings that told me like my that 35 to 36 is when i officially start this like next stage of my life so in the next year a lot more change is gonna happen oh no i know me too i i well, I know a lot already. I don't want to say it in case my counterpart watches and freak her out. But, I, like, you know, I feel like the divine has given me a book and said, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to be successful. This is how you're going to do it. That's how I feel. I see it. I already know what I'm going to do. I already, I already have plans. She says she's on board to the, my plans, right? So I'm like, okay, you're on board. So, like, we have this thing. I'm selling my place. I'm buying more property. I'm opening up a spiritual retreat. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm like so excited though. Like I, I have it all planned. I know exactly how it's going to be. Like, so we'll see how it unfolds, right? That's awesome. I look forward to coming in and seeing it. One yeah, day. yeah, yeah. So you guys, this is Benji Shear. You got to check him out. I'll post a link. I'll make sure you have a link to his website. Uh, I'll make sure you have a link to his book. And oops, but you know, it was really great talking to you. <laughs> Take care, Benji. Thanks. All right, speak to you soon. Bye.